Hello, um, and welcome to uh, the second lecture on the cognitive neuroscience of memory. Uh, in the previous lecture, I gave a quick historical introduction to some of the important figures and research conducted in this area. It really set up uh, some of the ways in which we discuss uh, the neuroscience of memory. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to give a very, very quick introduction to some of the very important parts of the brain associated with learning and memory. Um, we'll, in f lectures that are forthcoming, uh, we'll be getting into some very specific ideas about how these parts work together, um, how this specific process works in various models. Um, but I think it's important to just start with uh, some a quick introduction to the anatomy, because as we start to get into um, memory difficulties like uh, uh, amnesia and dementia in the next lecture, it's important to have at least a little bit of an idea about what's going on. So we're going to start off um, quick with an introduction about some major processes in memory. Again, trying to get some language out, um, get us all talking uh, in the same uh, on the same page. Then we're going to talk about the hippocampus, uh, medial temporal lobes, and then some other structures. And again, this will be pretty quick, um, but very important setup for other discussions. So let's first get out uh, this question of major processes in memory. And the first of these is what we call encoding. And this is how we process incoming information and experiences. This is how we take, how your brain takes today and turns it into a memory. How it takes what you studied for an exam and turns it into a memory. So this includes acquisition. And this is the role our sensory attention, executive functioning systems play um, a key role in. As we're starting to acquire information, uh, one of the things we know, for example, if you're trying to study for an exam, uh, you will acquire that information far better if you use your working memory to elaborate on it. Think about the material, try to um, associate it with past experiences or other things that you know about. So that acquisition is an important part of that. And so that's the process which we might have some control over as we're trying to learn or think about trying to remember something later. Um, so many of you may be like myself and are wretchedly bad with remembering names. I'm horrible at it. Um, I can remember all sorts of things that really aren't that important, but names are things that I can't remember. <laughs> so while we can discuss uh, 1970s television trivia um, and I can sing music that I haven't heard in 20 years, um, remembering someone's name is impossible. And a lot of that has to do with that acquisition. Uh, because we don't have oftentimes any way to elaborate on or connect that information in some way. And so that's an important part of understanding encoding. Consolidation is a biological process by which our memories are then encoded for longer term storage. And we're going to talk a little bit about this in the next lecture as we look at how memory can be disrupted in a procedure like electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Um, and so consolidation is the process by which our brains take our experiences and turn them into permanent memory storage. A uh, number of things are important for this process. Not a lot that we have control over, one of the most important of which is sleep, however. Uh, we do know that sleep is really critically important for consolidation of our experiences into long-term memory. And so one of the things I'm always encouraging my students is to not ever do all-nighters. Cramming all night is a terrible way in which to try to study. You're never going to remember the information you studied. Um, it's far better to study than sleep and then study again the next morning. Um, but, you know, you know, students, they don't always listen. Um, <laughs> so that then gets us to storage, the next important process. This is how uh, our permanent record of information, how things are stored. And we're starting to unpack a little bit about how this works. We know there are biological processes for um, essentially forgetting, that is going through and clearing out stuff we don't need to remember anymore, <laughs> um, or uh, shifting its storage. All of this seems to be uh, uh, an important biological process that we're starting to learn more about. And then finally we get to retrieval. Uh, and this involves a uh, accessing stored memories. Um, and importantly, retrieval also creates a new memory trace. It essentially opens that memory um, and allows us to edit it a bit. That is really the way to think about it. And there's some really interesting um, processes involved in um, that particular process. So um, there's a really terrific uh, Nova special called Memory Hackers that I have my students watch. And they demonstrate in there that you can actually um, alter the quality of memories, particularly stressful or traumatic memories, 
um, or fear memories. And so one of the things they show is by giving a drug called propanolol, um, when a memory is opened, uh, that memory is then reconsolidated or re-encoded uh, after it's been retrieved. And the drug propranolol blocks um, norepinephrine, uh, which is it's our stress or maybe stress hormone. And so essentially they're able to take the stress out of that memory. And so there's a lot of work being done in trying to treat PTSD patients with drugs like propanolol and MDMA uh, by essentially disconnecting uh, the fearful component from that memory. The memory's still there, but it no longer has that significant affective component. And so when we start talking about uh, emotion in the next chapter, so it's going to be a few lectures down the road, um, we'll really get into that. So it's really important. All right, so let's get into talking about the hippocampus. We're going to start with just a general overview here, then we'll talk about the dentate gyrus and Ammon's horn. So a uh, really terrific uh, figure from the Gazanica textbook where you can see the hippocampus uh, is buried underneath the temporal lobes. Um, we have the parahippocampal cortex, the anterior rhinal cortex, the parahippocampal cortex. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but the hippocampus is uh, this seahorse-shaped structure uh, that curls up underneath the temporal lobes and sort of comes up, <coughs> forms the fornix, which then surrounds the uh, thalamus. A couple of other important things to note we'll talk about here in a minute are the amygdala, which is, of course, the part of the brain that's responsible for a lot of our emotional processing. Uh, you can actually see right where that mammillary body is at. It's going to be an important diencephalic midline structure, but also right in that area is the olfactory bulb. And so oftentimes we think about scent memory as having a little bit different quality. They're not necessarily better, uh, but there may be a little bit different uh, component. You can also see um, while we're here talking about some important brain structures, uh, medial prefrontal cortex is being very important for encoding, and we're going to get into that in later um, lectures. So frontal cortex is important for both encoding and retrieval of memories. Uh, but the hippocampus is really what we're focused on at this point. So let's dive into the parts of uh, the hippocampus that are particularly important. So the dentate gyrus, which you can see here um, sort of in the lower middle portion of that right hand of that figure, um, which sort of loops around. And this is actually a rat, a, a drawing of a rat hippocampus, but very similar to um, humans. Uh, within the dentate gyrus are what we call granule cells, and this is the source of what we call neurogenesis, so the generation of new neurons. And this is a relatively new finding in neuroscience, certainly in the last 20 years, um, where we actually create new neurons, and those new neurons then go on to be an important part of formation of memories as well as the forgetting of memories. What's important about the dentate gyrus is it's a pretty... Um, sensitive area of the brain. It's very susceptible to um, anoxia, which is reductions in levels of oxygen, as well as elevated cortisol levels. So one of the things we know about stress in memory is when we undergo a great deal of stress, uh, we get elevated cortisol levels, and that elevated cortisol then reduces neurogenesis in this part of the hippocampus and can also damage those granule cells. And so trying to repair that, either prevent or repair that damage becomes very important. So we start thinking about how things like exercise and diet and um, pharmacological treatments for depression can um, mitigate that damage to the dentate gyrus. And then wrapping around uh, the sort of lower and then upper parts of the um, hippocampus uh, is Ammon's horn. There are a number of layers of uh, Ammon's horn that we're going to talk about, but there are um, subfields that contain what we call pyramidal cells. And they're called pyramidal cells because as they're drawn here, and actually if you look at them under a microscope, they look like little pyramids. Um, so the CA1 and CA3 subfields are particularly important. Um, these are also susceptible to injury, particularly CA1, and these seem to be very important for uh, formations of memory. There are a number of pathways uh, that I want to point out while we're sitting here looking at uh, the subfields of the hippocampus. You can see the preferent path of pathway, uh, the Schaefer collateral pathway, the mossy fiber pathway, and we're going to see some outputs to the fimbria as well as up to anterior neo uh, association areas, anterior rhinal cortex, etc., where we get inputs and outputs uh, to and from the hippocampus. 
So we have to think very carefully about how these uh, pathways, the preferent pathway, the mossy fiber pathway, and the Schaefer collateral pathway are all important uh, parts uh, of forming and creating and retrieving memories. So that gets us to the medial temporal lobes. Um, and again, just a very quick overview, sort of three uh, important components of the medial temporal lobes, the anterior rhinal cortex, the parorhinal cortex, and the parahippocampal complex. So if we sort of peel the temporal lobes uh, aside, uh, there are some fairly um, significant but not particularly large areas of the temporal lobes that are going to become important parts in understanding um, encoding and retrieval of memories. So you kind of see um, the parorhinal cortex is just a little um, lateral to the parahippocampal cortex. The anterior rhinal cortex is a little bit in posterior, sorry. Um, and these become very important in our understanding of memory. So we're going to take a look at this figure again uh, in later uh, lectures where we get this interaction between the hippocampus and anterior rhinal cortex. Then we get uh, interactions between anterior rhinal cortex and parorhinal and parahippocampal cortex. And then those interact with the frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and cingulate cortices. So we get sensory input into the parorhinal and parahippocampal cortex. That then goes through the anterior rhinal cortex down to the hippocampus and then back up again. So some other structures that are particularly important for uh, memory that we're going to talk about, the diencephalic midline, which includes the mammillary bodies, the medial dorsal thalamic nuclei, and the anterior thalamus. Uh, the thalamus is, of course, uh, our major sensory switchboard, so sensory information is uh, an important component here. Uh, what we're looking at in this particular figure <coughs> is the loss of mammillary bodies. As I recall, this is a Korsakoff's amnesia patient. Korsakoff's amnesia um, causes significant damage to the mammillary bodies. Uh, due to a thymine deficiency, which is secondary to liver damage. Um, but these uh, can be damaged in other ways. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about um, penetrating injuries. There's a case study of uh, an individual who, as I recall, they're professors. I know this is one of those stories you just hear. Um, anyway, it's a good cautionary tale. Um, yeah, anyway, so they're screwing around with fencing foils, you know, fencing in their office, and um, the one ends up getting a fencing foil that goes into his nose, pierces his brain, um, severs the connections to the mammillary bodies, and he had instant amnesia. Um, so don't do that. Be careful with that. Um, other important structures, uh, the amygdala, very important um, in emotional processing. Very close to that is the olfactory bulb. Um, again, tying in with emotion memory and scent memory. And then we'll talk about the fornix and cingulate gyrus as important parts as well. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to um, some of the anatomy we'll be talking about. We'll develop this into a, a pretty formal model of memory in later lectures. In the next lecture, we're going to talk uh, about amnesia and dementia.